Namaste. So this is the final video of the Devi Kalotra series. Um, and it sums everything up. Lord Shiva is going to instruct in the rest of the series, the rest of the shlokas, how to meditate on the void or that you should meditate on the void. He doesn't give much detail. And for Westerners, for inexperienced people, this is a problem. So I want to fill in some of the details and, and give you some um, structural information on how this stuff works from the Buddhist teaching. And hopefully that will enable you to practice this if you have the qualifications. If you don't, it won't work. That's how you know. <laughs> so if you try this, meditation on the void, and you, the mind is out of control, and you're having a hard time, and it's like difficult, and you're distracted, and that, it means you're not qualified. Go back do some bhakti, do some karma yoga even, huh? and clean up your act. Get rid of as much of the mental agitation as you can. Then when you are a ripe tivra adhikari, hmm, then try this again. So, what are we talking about? We're talking about going to a secluded place, like here I am out in the jungle, a quiet place where there are no distractions, no interruptions, and make a seat, some cushions on the floor, something like that so that you can sit with your body upright, head and neck in a straight position. Uh, I don't know why exactly the seating position, the posture is so important, but it is. I think it has to do with aligning the, the vertebrae and opening up the internal channels in the spine. At least that's what some people say. So, sit down, sit properly, as my Adi Guru used to say. And then what? Okay, I have to give you now some structural information about the mind. What are we trying to do? We're trying to get rid of conditioned consciousness. Buddha calls this vijnana, which is Sanskrit vijnana. Huh? The vijnana maya kosha is the almost the, the next to the last subtle body. You have the anamaya kosha, the food body, the pranamaya kosha, the energy body, the Manomaya Kosha, the mental body, the Vijnana Maya Kosha, which is the consciousness body or will body or intention body, and then finally the Ananda Maya Kosha. <laughs> and all of these lower bodies have to be given up. But now Shiva is saying, and Buddha also said, there is a direct way. And what is that? You go straight to the Vijnana Maya Kosha and dissolve it. How do you do that? <laughs> well, consciousness is something very subtle. Because it's so subtle, you can't work with it directly. I mean, try it. huh? Sit down and try to get rid of your conditioned consciousness. Good luck. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Just like 
if you're working on some computer software, computer software is also subtle. You can't touch it. Huh? You can't move it around and do stuff with it huh? directly. You have to go indirectly using the appropriate tools. Something of the same nature or even more subtle. So, you cannot uh, handle or change or uh, control consciousness directly. So what do you do? Well, the Buddha sums up his teaching. He says, all that which is of nature to arise also has a nature to disappear. In other words, whatever is born is going to die. Whatever has a beginning has an end. Whatever is an effect has a cause. So his idea is that instead of trying to work with consciousness directly, you work with the cause. And then the consciousness will change automatically. So, this is called paticca samupada. Paticca samupada means conditioned arising or dependent origination or dependent co-arising or, I don't know, there's so many different translations and they're all wrong. <laughs> paticca samupada, that's the Pali. And it means exactly what I just said. For everything that comes into existence, there is a cause. When that cause is removed, that thing disappears. We talked about this last time. When you have a cause and its effect, they're not two things. They're linked. Huh? Just like if you have a stick. I don't have a stick handy. But if I did, <laughs> the stick has two ends, right? This end and that end. We call them two different things, the near end and the far end or whatever. But they're not really two different things. They're part of one stick. So in the same way, consciousness, because it arises, doesn't it? It has a beginning. Like every morning when you wake up, mowing, consciousness arises. Not only just conscious, a particular type of consciousness arises. It's called jagrat, which means conditioned by objects. This conditioned consciousness is the cause of our suffering, or one of the causes, in the chain of causes and effects that produces suffering. So if we want to change our consciousness, we have to find out what causes it. And according to the Buddha's teaching, what causes consciousness is something called sankhara. Sankhara is variously translated preparations, fermentations, fabrications, um, so many different translations, and they're all wrong. <laughs> there is no English word that corresponds to sankhara. But to give it an idea, sankhara is used in the context of a theatrical artist putting on makeup. You could say a sankhara is an intention to assume a particular state of being. An intention to assume a particular state of being. And, of course, that's linked with the state of consciousness and so on. So the cause of consciousness, our conditioned consciousness, which is a cause of suffering, is the intention to, produ to produce or attain a certain type of being. 
ask any little kid, what do you want to be when I when you grow up? I want to be a fireman. I want to be a jet pilot. I want to be something powerful. <laughs> Most kids are like that. Something great. Something special. This is a Sankara. A very good example of Sankara is like we talked about in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, which you did look up and read, right? <laughs> Where Buddha talks about how we project the thought I and mine upon our uh, perceptions. When we perceive an object, at first we just perceive the thing as it is, or as we perceive it through the senses anyway. So like right now I'm hearing a jet plane. Now all I actually hear is this kind of whooshing, thundering sound. But because of past experience, I'm able to identify it as a plane. So hearing just the pure sound is called immediate consciousness or direct consciousness. Consciousness is always consciousness of something, an object, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, or thought in the mind. So when my consciousness contacts this sensation, this sound, then memory comes into it and says, oh, well, we experienced this kind of sound before. This is the sound of a jet plane. So then I identify the sound. That's called reflexive consciousness because it's a reflex. It's a habit. It's not something that we do deliberately unless there's something new that we can't identify with our ordinary ref reflexive uh, consciousness, then we have to think about it. What is that? <laughs> like when you see some of these new insects around here, really weird. <laughs> I said, what is that? But most of the time, when we see something, we immediately identify it and put a label on it. If you are into software, it's like a pointer. And then, if you want to manipulate that object, you don't need to go to the thing itself. You can manipulate the pointer. Isn't it? That's a name. Name and form go together. But anyway, to get back to our <laughs> to get back to our story, we're trying to change our consciousness. We don't want to be stuck in reflexive consciousness. We don't want to be handling a bunch of names. We want to be in contact with reality directly. Direct consciousness, immediate consciousness. Without anything in between. Without all this software. Without the conditions. So, that means we have to remove the causes of conditioned consciousness, which are the sankhara, the intentions to attain a certain type of being. Now, what are the classifications of sankharas? There are four, four types. Sense pleasures, dejection, the needs of the body, and, oh God, what's the fourth one? <laughs> I'll remember it in a minute. Let me go back. Desires for sense pleasures. Sense pleasures are totally unnecessary. You can live without them. But because we want to attain a certain state of being, I want to be a great lover, so I need a lover. I want to be a great driver, so I need a car. I want to be a great scholar, so I need books, knowledge, and so on. You see, this is how desires come to be. And desire is the trap. Then there's dejection. Oh, 
This enlightenment business is too hard. I'll never do it. It takes so long, and it's so much work, and nobody's going to help me. Boo-hoo-hoo. -hoo, huh? I suppose you could lump uh, depression and stuff like that in with dejection from attaining self-realization. Because self-realization is happiness. Therefore, if you're unhappy, it means you don't have it, <laughs> or you don't think you have it. And then there's the needs of the body. These are simple. Food, sleep, exercise, shelter, you know, simple things, right? So these have to be taken care of in moderation. There's no way we can continue to live without taking care of the body. So these are a must. But they should not be overindulged. Huh? So we have sense pleasures, needs of the body, dejection. What is that fourth one? Well, anyway, all of them, just so you can identify a sankaro when you observe it in yourself, all of them are intentions or aspirations to attain a certain state of being. I want to be X. I want to become Y. I want to be seen as Z. I want others to think I am such and such, and so on. All the way from the gross sense desires up to the more, most subtle thought, which is, I want to exist as an individual. I want to be an I. So, what does the Buddha say? Avidya nirodha sankara nirodho. That when ignorance is destroyed, sankaras are also destroyed. Because ignorance is the cause of sankara. If we knew, first of all, about sankaras, and we also knew that they are a cause of suffering, then we would not entertain them. We would not create them. We would not allow them. Uh, and especially, we would not cause them. If we knew, well, now you know, because I just told you. <laughs> and if we knew, huh, vidya, if we knew that removing these sankharas will also remove conditioned consciousness, then we definitely wouldn't give them the time of the day. Uh, and that's the very next line in the sutta I was quoting. Sankara nirodha, vidyana nirodho. When these sankaras are finished, conditioned consciousness also disappears. See, enlightenment is not a thing that you can get. Rather, it's a process of removing the obscurations. That's all. So when you take away the causes of conditioned consciousness, conditioned consciousness itself disappears automatically. That is the secret. That is the practice. Shiva in the Devi Kalotara calls it meditation on the void. But in practice, it means the same thing. He says, give up all worldly desires. Sankara. Give up the desire to attain any state of being in the material world. Avidya, ignorance. Because by doing that, you will only reap suffering. Then, 
Just sit there. Just wait. Huh? Like the Zen master says, I sit here doing nothing, and the spring comes and the grass grows all by itself. Om Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum.